Okay, so let's back up to the, to the passage that we just <coughs> read. Uh, and, and just to remind you how that all transpired, uh, Cornelius was a God-fearer. Uh, after Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead, Cornelius was a Roman centurion, okay? Uh, and he believed in God, didn't know about Jesus, right? But he was he helped the poor and all that sort of thing and, and, and believed in God. Uh, there were a group of Gentiles uh, before Christ who were called God-fearers who, who worshipped Yahweh, right? But they were not allowed in the temple, okay, or, or the uh, synagogues. They had to stay outside. And so he must have been one of them. So, and, and he tried to please God. He, he realized who God was and tried to worship and please God, okay? And uh, God heard his prayer and, 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 and his sacrifices came up before God as a pleasing offering, right? So God sent an angel that appeared to Cornelius and told Cornelius, send to Joppa to uh, the house of Simon the Tanner for a man named Peter and have him come and, and talk to you. So he got some of his servants the next day and sent them to Joppa, which was a, a town on the, on the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and, and lo and behold, at the same point in time, at this point in time, as those people began, those servants got close to Simon's house in Joppa, Peter was there and he went up on the roof now, back in that day, on the roof was used, a lot of times they'd sleep out there on the roof, right? I mean, it's a flat roof. They had, they had uh, sun fish out there and dry them out. I mean, it was used. They'd hang their clothes out, kind of a clothesline and be out there and all that kind of stuff on the roof, right? So, I mean, Peter went up on the roof and um, like some do, he took him a little siesta, you know, up there on the roof, and while he was having his little <laughs> snooze, he saw this bed sheet being lowered down from heaven with all these unclean animals. You know, remember he's Jewish, all these unclean animals on it, and, and it came down in front of him, and, and the Lord said, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Not me, Lord. I've never touched anything that was unclean. That happened three times in a row. And then when Peter woke up, he's, he's trying to figure out what that might have meant. Just as those uh, servants of Cornelius come to the front gate asking for Peter at the house of Simon the Tanner. Right? So, so Peter, I mean, he puts two and two together. And, 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 the, and of course, the Lord had told him to go with them. The Holy Spirit said, go with these men. And so they stayed overnight there at Simon the Tanner's house. And the next morning they got up, uh, got them a breakfast burrito and hit the trail, you know. And they, they head back to Cornelius' house. And when they get to Cornelius's, his family and friends are all gathered there to listen. They, they may have had a courtyard, you know, something like that. Uh, some of the houses did back then. He was a centurion, so he probably maybe a little better house than some. And so he had some room there and there was no tell. They were, you know, I mean, you can imagine how that might have been. You know, they were youngins and they were probably elderly folks and there were people of all ages there and they all sat and listened to Peter say what he just said, right? Y'all remember that? And while he was still talking, the Holy Spirit fell on those people and they believed the gospel, right? They believed and they began showing signs of the Holy Spirit, which, which was more certainly more prevalent in that day. It was a sign that the Holy Spirit was there. They began speaking in, in, in foreign languages, okay? So which is what had happened at Pentecost, yeah, okay. So there you go. Just saying, the power of the gospel is real. Okay. So let me, the outstretched hand of God. 
Uh, now that was as astonishing to Peter that, that God would reach out to the Gentiles. He didn't, you know, he wasn't going to take that step on his own. Peter wouldn't have done it. If he hadn't felt like the Lord was really pushing him to go, uh, this, I believe, is the first time that the gospel is, is really proclaimed to the Gentiles. But certainly Peter is his first time. So it, it's an eye-opening experience that God is offering. And, and, and Jesus told Peter and them, you know, when he was about to ascend to heaven, it's proclaim the gospel in Jerusalem and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, right? To the Jews first, then the Samaritans, who are the enemies too, right? And then the whole world, you know, the Gentiles. So it was time for, you know, the lid to be ripped off of that can and for the gospel to be proclaimed to the Gentiles, right? So we can't, sometimes we, we're, we're astounded at, at how God reaches out to people. Um, certainly Peter was. So where do you think the fastest growing church in the world is? <coughs> Is it in Nacogdoches, Texas? No. Is it in America? No. Iran. Iran. Yes. There's a, there's a, if you look on YouTube, there's a, a video out there, a documentary out there. Uh, and, and the people have found, and, and, and they got people that are growing the church inside Iran. And, and this is what they said. They said, Islam is dead in Iran. He said, what, what if I told you the mosques are empty inside of Iran? What if I told you no one follows Islam inside of Iran? Would you believe me? Uh, but he says, that's exactly what is happening inside of Iran. God is moving very powerfully inside Iran. Uh, he said that uh, the best evangelist for Jesus is the Ayatollah Khomeini. He said after, after 40 years under Islamic rule, supposed to be a utopia of Islam, they've had the worst devastation in the 5,000 year history of Iran. So the people are not believing it anymore. They know it's a sham and a lie. Amen. And they're hungry for the truth. And, and he goes on to say that it's a church without buildings, without property, without central leadership, but still it's steadily growing. Uh, the movement <coughs> saying is not to plant churches, but to grow disciples. It said that converts will run away when the persecution comes, but, but they begin by making disciples because a disciple will take the heat. They won't run. They will stand there even if you cut off their head. They will continue to follow Christ. That's what's going on inside who, what we think is our enemy, Iran. The Iranian people might just see things a little differently. Isn't that funny how God works, right? Um, it's a it's funny thing. And, and I'll just add this little little thing, little caveat or whatever. Uh, most of the most of the leadership in the Iranian church, if there isn't, it's really not a church, right? It's just people. It's women. The same thing as in China, you know. It's women that are that are proclaiming the gospel, that are carrying it forward, that are building the church inside of Iran and China, and that are helping to, to disciple people and make disciples for Christ. Ain't that funny? Yeah. You didn't expect to come and hear that today, did you? Amen. That's the hand of God. He's always reaching out, y'all. Uh, and and <laughs> all Peter does 
in front of these people is he gives them the gospel, the simple gospel message, right? I mean, y'all read it. That's what Peter said to them. It's the gospel. You know, here comes Jesus. You know, we, we saw him, we ate with him, and, and he was perfect, and he was killed for our sins and raised in power by God. Uh, and sometimes, y'all, we get jaded by that message. I'm just going to say, here in America, uh, a friend of mine, uh, James Lofton, who's a, a missionary in China uh, that, that I, I, I've known for, for years and, and uh, pray for him quite often and try to help him a little bit, um, he sent out a, an email. I don't know if I shared that one with you, Ken. Uh, I may have about um, how he was disappointed. He, he said over Christmas he saw, you know, in America how children all know the story about Jesus, you know. And, and it's kind of become a rote thing. You know, we know, okay, big deal, right? People in China haven't heard it they don't know and his, his his point was we we need to be concerned about that we need to be more urgent in trying to share that message with a world that is lost that hasn't heard that message because it has the power to transform lives to change people's hearts and lives. There's supernatural power in the truth of God's word. There is freedom from the bondage of sin and death for anyone who believes it. Simple message. We need to try and proclaim it to a world that is lost, right? I mean, it, and it may mean being sacrificial and, 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 and helping foreign missionaries, right? The church in Africa, the United Methodist Church in Africa is exploding because these people haven't heard, right? And when they hear, they, a lot of them will come to faith and they believe it. I mean, they stand on the truth of God's word and they are dedicated. They are committed, right? I mean, a friend of mine from Zimbabwe, Chris Chikori, uh, pastor I went to school at Asbury with um, he said his wife had a healing service every Sunday morning at 5 o'clock in the morning and the, the church was packed every Sunday for people coming to receive prayer for healing okay. just saying just saying y'all um <laughs> All right, there's a, I believe Jim might have shared this with me here a while back. Uh, there was a, an American named Jacob DeShazer, who was one of the Doolittle's Raiders back in World War II. Y'all remember that raid where we flew those airplanes off of the aircraft carriers to bomb uh, mainland Japan? And because they, after Pearl Harbor, we needed to, we needed something for a morale booster. So we sent them over there, and when they had to start way offshore, uh, and they didn't have enough fuel to make it back, right? So they, they had to ditch their planes, they had to fly on over Japan. They dropped their payload in Japan, and, and the only thing they could do was try to get to China. Uh, some of them made it, some of them didn't. And they knew that there was very real chance that they might be taken prisoner and Jacob de Chazer was taken prisoner by the Japanese once he made it to, to China. Uh, he was imprisoned for 40 months, 34 of those months he was in solitary confinement. Uh, he asked his Japanese captors uh, once during his uh, time there uh, for a Bible and, and they can't, happened to find one. I guess it was in English because he couldn't have read it otherwise I don't think. So, and, and, and he only was, had it for three weeks, but during those three weeks, he read it and he accepted Jesus as his Lord, right? And, and he became a Christian. And when the war was over, the paratroopers 
came in in August of 1945 and set him free from captivity. Uh, he became a pastor and an evangelist and began to proclaim the good news about Jesus. He he, he wrote those gospel tracts. Have y'all seen those little tracts, those little handouts, right? That uh, He wrote some of those back in the day. And lo and behold, uh, a Japanese officer who had been at Pearl Harbor named Mitsui Fushida, uh, who gave the command for the Japanese to, to send the message back to their, their, their leadership, and you've probably seen the movie, Torah, 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 right? That may, meaning they caught them by complete surprise, caught the, the Americans by complete surprise. He sent that message back. He was he fought on in the war, was, was, was injured during the war. Uh, after the war was over, uh, some of it, he ended up having to testify in, in trials with some of his contemporaries that were being charged with war crimes for the way they treated the American prisoners during the war, right? And some of them were convicted, right? Uh, probably executed for their crimes. And, and he suspected that the Americans had done the same thing. So he found one of his uh, contemporaries who had been imprisoned by the Americans at, at the Battle of Midway. And, and he said, hey, so tell me, how was your treatment? by the Americans. Tell me that they mistreated you and that they were, and the guy said, oh no, no. He says, as a matter of fact, there was a lady named Peggy Cavell who ministered to us. She came in and made sure we were taken care of and treated us with respect and dignity. And he said, her parents were murdered by the Japanese they were missionaries in, Philippi, in the Philippines, but yet, even though we had murdered her parents, she still reached out to us in a loving way to take care of us and make sure we were treated <coughs> well. And Mits, Mitsui said, wait, that just doesn't make sense. Who would do that? Who would not return anger and, and retribution for what we've done for them. And so we began to be curious about Christianity, right? And lo and behold, one day he runs across a, a pamphlet from Jacob Deschauver, who had been the American with the little traders, who had been captive by the Japanese for those many years. And he read it and it pierced his heart. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ and began following, began preaching the gospel. And, and as a matter of fact, he and, and Jacob DeShazer would actually end up preaching together the gospel and see many come to Christ because of what God had done, the outstretched hand of God. It doesn't see national boundaries, y'all. It doesn't stop at the Rio Grande. The good news about Christ goes everywhere and touches hearts and lives for the sake of Christ. Um, just like, just like it did. So, Lake Optima, have y'all ever heard of Lake Optima? It's over in Oklahoma. It's one of those things I heard about when I went up to uh, Perryton a couple weeks ago. Uh, some of the guys were talking about it at New Year's Eve get together, and uh, I've never heard of it. Uh, so come to find out. I did some research on it. It was started by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers back in the day, you know, and, and they started in earnest in 19, I believe, 64, 65, something like that, building this reservoir. There was some around here, right, about that same period of time, right, Lake Livingston, Sam Rayburn, maybe Nacogdoches, Lake Nacogdoches, I'm not sure, uh, but y'all get it, you know, that's what happened, the reservoirs, right? So uh, this one started, it was finished, I believe, in 1976. Oh, wait. It's dry. 
41, 46 million dollars later and 12 years later, it was finished. And finally in 2009, the US Army Corps of Engineers abandoned the project. It's a total loss. It never filled up because the river that they were, that was feeding it, they began to pull water out of it upstream for irrigation and what have you. And it, it was just a little old beady creek by the time it got to the reservoir. And it's, they've abandoned the project, right? So why am I showing you all this? Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who fills us. Okay. Amen. With life giving sustenance, right? The one who sustains us, the one who empowers us and enables us, who gets us up in the morning, who puts us down at night, who gives us the good news to carry with us all day, every day. Because we are the born again believers of, in, in the Son of God, right? And we have eternity, eternal life in our bosom, right? I mean, we're, we're not empty like Lake Optima. That shouldn't be us, right? That should not be us. So the presence of the Holy Spirit is essential to the life of the church. And the presence of the Holy Spirit is essential to our lives. He's the one who comforts us, the one who leads us, the one who prays for us, the one who shows God to us, and the one who helps us to live the life abundant in Jesus. Um, just a little, I'm going to segue off to the side here just a second. Ran across something this, this week uh, about the power of four. Okay. And I believe it was the, the I forget the organization that did the study. It was a study that was done, and I forgive me, I, I had to look it up uh, again. I meant to write it down. I didn't. <laughs> Imagine that. Anyway, there was a study done by this organization about the power of reading the scriptures. And they did this study, and, and, and it involved people from 8 to 80, just all, you know, you know people that go to church, <laughs> people that go once in a while, all that kind of stuff. People are in small groups, people that, you know, all, all kinds of folks. What they found was if you open the Bible once a week, really there's no change in your life compared to somebody that doesn't ever even darken the door of a church. If you open it twice a week, same. Three times a week, there was a little blip, little, little, little improvement. But for those who, who, who four times a week engage with God's holy word, right? And what does Jesus say? I'm just, to, to, he told this to the devil, right? Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So I, I, let me step out and say, I think that the Holy Spirit is in us. But he needs some sustenance. If you want to see him make a difference in your life, you're going to have to crack open God's word and feed on it and, and let the spirit have that power that he draws from the word of God, right? Jesus is the word made flesh, right? So, so in doing pulling from the word of God, you're pulling from Jesus, which empowers the Holy Spirit and changes lives, right? Changes our life first. So let me show you this that they discovered. Read the scripture four times a week. 60% less likely to feel spiritually stagnant. 59% less likely to view pornography. That's a major problem for men in the church in America today is pornography. Men in the church I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about men. Statistics proves that that's the, one of the biggest drains on the men of the church is pornography. Do you hear me? 
30% less likely to struggle with loneliness, 31% less likely to struggle with forgiving others. If you open the word of God four times a week, is that something you can do? 416% more likely to give financially to the church. You're more likely to get it, to understand that it ain't about getting them toys at the house that are going to rust and don't end up at the dump. What really means something is proclaiming the gospel to the world. That's the only thing that lasts. That's it. 218% more likely to give financially causes other than the church. 228% more likely to share their faith with others. And 231% more likely to be discipling somebody else. So if you're spiritually stagnant, if you're wondering if the Holy Spirit is in you, take this test. Crack open God's Word four times, five times, seven times a week and see what happens in your world. I don't know. You try it. Try it <laughs> and see what you find out. I think you'll make a change in your life. I mean, this, hey, just say it. All right. So, is it worth it? I don't know. You say. I think it is. <laughs> I think it's definitely worth it. I think there's enough depression and suicide going around that the world needs to change something. <clears throat> How many people have y'all known that have committed suicide in the, this last year or two? Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. We probably all know multiple people. It ain't always been that way, y'all. I'm just going to say, I, I'm going to get a little Bible thumping here with y'all. But the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Sorry. It's getting dark out there. <clears throat> the leading cause of death this last year was abortion worldwide. You understand that? It wasn't cancer. It wasn't heart attacks. It was abortion. <clears throat> Do you recall that? Now, you may not agree with me on this. I don't care. The society that, that, that became Israel and Judah, you know what one of the big things God had against them? Was sacrificing their children to Molech. A society that has done that is, is gone. I mean, it is on, it is on a, it is going nowhere fast. So it's no surprise, forgive me for being a preacher and a Bible thumper, but it ain't a surprise that we're having all this problem. It ain't a surprise that, that politics has gone crazy in this country. It ain't a surprise that the United Methodist Church is about to blow apart. It's more of that's coming, y'all. I'm sorry. If, if, if this country doesn't turn and repent, there's more of that coming. It's getting a lot darker all the time. Now, that may be a, a fatalistic view, but I'll say this. Our hope is in Christ. Amen. He's our only hope. Amen. Amen. It ain't in this world. It ain't in Donald Trump. It ain't in Schumer and Pelosi. If that's your hope, then, then you have no hope. Amen. Sorry. It ain't, that ain't it. If it's in the Republican Party, if it's in the Democratic Party, yeah. you, you have done miss the truth. <laughs> yeah. It's in Jesus. All right? You got to follow Jesus, right? Yeah. So, all right. Anybody want to say anything?
God is good, and there's hope in God for all who repent and come to him and seek his face, whether you're from Iran or China or Japan, God is able to revive you and to renew you. Johnny, what you got? I just want to say this. Uh, a while back, man, it's been a while back, I got in trouble. I got in jail. I was in jail. I was in there with uh, probably about 12 guys. And I asked them to recite a Bible when I first got in jail. And I started reading my Bible. And I read it that day. I read it another day. I read it another day. Third time, God got me out of that jail. See the judge, see the judge, pay my fines. As soon as I walked out of the church, out of the, out of the jail, God sent my mother to pick me up. I'm going to tell you, if you ever get in trouble, ever get without anything, you get your Bible, start reading it, and God will get you out of it. <laughs> and, I, and that's true. She, she, uh, and then I had enough money to, to pay my fine, <coughs> just enough money to pay my fines and get out of jail. Okay. That's how God works. Well, our hope's in God. It ain't in anything in this world. That's my point. And Cornelius and those people in his family and his friends found that out that day. I mean, they were Romans. They lived in a different world, different time. But it's still the same, y'all. He's still our hope and our salvation. It's in Christ. Are we going to get persecuted? You betcha. Everybody ain't going to believe like you do. Everybody ain't going to follow Jesus. People are going to make fun of you, right? They're going to, especially, you know, as fewer and fewer people come to church, fewer and fewer people are following the Lord here in America. It ain't the same, though, in, in Africa, right? And in, in Asia. I mean, the greatest revivals maybe the world has ever known are happening there now. So I don't really follow these folks that say the end is near, you know, here in America, just because the American church is going south. There's revival going on elsewhere. You need to look at that, too. And God doesn't see skin color. He, it doesn't matter to him if you're Asian or black. He's looking for hearts that will, that will repent and come to him and follow his son. Right? Amen. Amen. So anyway, that's enough.